Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 452, featuring part one of a new series of interviews, probably do three parts, uh, with Mr. Brian Hines of Obsidian. And this uh, first installment, we talk a lot about the Outer Worlds game, uh, what makes it different than Fallout and what makes it different than other CRPGs that are out there. Uh, what are Brian's visions, his uh, philosophy and design, and much, much more. A lot of great stuff here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Brian Hines. Hello folks, I am here today with Mr. Brian Heinz, the project director of Obsidian Entertainment. He's worked on a lot of the games I bet you have played, especially if you're a fan of this channel, including uh, Tyranny. He's also worked on a lot of games, actually. The Outer Worlds, Pillars of Eternity 2, Dead Fire, South Park, The Stick of Truth, can't wait to get to that one, as uh, well as uh, Wildstar and Alpha, Pro uh, Pro <laughs> Alpha Protocol. Awesome resume, Brian. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. It's uh, definitely the events of the past few months have been taking some adjusting to, but uh, working from home is good. I have an awesome background behind me, as you can yeah, see. So Exactly. Uh, so what have you been able to get done with all, all this stuff going on? I was just watching the Grounded trailer. That looks pretty awesome. Uh, I also see that there's some efforts to bring the Outer Worlds, just admiring your background there, to uh, the yes. Switch. You know, excited about that, too. Uh, just wondering, like, what have you been up to lately? Uh, so I'm actually the content director on an unannounced title that oh. uh, um, brand new team. I'm sorry. No, just a top secret project. Yeah, uh, nothing we're going to talk about probably for a couple years before it gets announced. But uh, yeah, right now it's a very small team. We're early in pre-production, just kind of working on like putting the ideas together to start getting the uh, the next uh, another large rpg in production so that'll be uh it's been interesting adjusting to working from home <laughs> in that situation but it's been good for me. i'm sure a lot of us can relate to that situation uh, probably still more fun to be doing what you do though than what a lot of us do uh speaking of small I definitely i'll go ahead that's for sure i was saying i can't complain that's for sure <laughs> well speaking of small teams and i kind of wanted to jump into the uh, the outer worlds you know, you've gotten to work with a lot of my favorite people in the world, really, just period. I mean, Tim Kaine, Leonard, you know, I've had both those on the show, great, great guys. And I remember they talked a lot about how they prefer the small teams. Uh, just wondering what it was like working on, working with those guys and on the Outer Worlds. And uh, do you think you accomplished your goal with that game? I noticed the goal was to make a spiritual successor to the game Fallout New Vegas. Yeah, I think so. This is actually my second time working with Tim Kaine. Uh, the first time was at uh, Carbine Studios working on Wildstar, oh, sure. the MMO. Yeah. Um, he, he, he left to come to Obsidian, and I, I followed soon after. So, actually, we worked together on several projects at Obsidian because we started working on South Park, Sick of Truth. We worked on uh, on Tyranny together, and now working on uh, working on Outer Worlds. So, um, working with him and Leonard has been great so far. The... Uh, they were really focused on trying to recapture a lot of the same feel from the Fallout games in the Outer Worlds. Obviously, it's a, a different game, different setting, but wanted to make sure that that player choice was at the heart of every, all the decisions we made for the game. So trying to make sure that every situation, players could create their own character and play that they wanted to play it. And even with some pain that caused us on the development side, it was definitely, I think I think it came out very well for a lot of players. We've seen a lot of great feedback from fans and the community about different choices they were able to make and different ways they could approach situations in the game. So that's been really good, good to see on our end. Yeah, I'd be really, really shocked if this hadn't been a great game, you know, given the talents, you know, at work here. And I've seen just stellar reviews all across the board, so I know you must be really happy. And excited about absolutely it. <laughs> <laughs> well you said you really like working in this new world uh the new worlds i guess however you want to say that uh i was wondering what you think most sets it apart from some of the stuff that's come before you know especially the fallout series i was kind of intrigued because one of the things i got into with leonard uh, when we were talking about the uh uh, the fallout games <laughs> the, mm. was, you know sort of the inspiration for that coming from these pulpy uh, sci-fi uh, 
stories from the 50s and 60s, but my understanding is you went further back for this one, back to like 20s and 30s pulps. So I, that's just kind of an unknown area for me, I have to say. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that. And, you know, what, what's so appealing about these sort of pulpy, old pulp sci-fi stories? Well, I think a lot of like the original pulp sci-fi stories, like the 20s and 30s that, that you're talking about, a lot of it was like driven by uh, American angst at the space race and and Sputnik overhead and people feel like, are the Russians spying on us? And now we know they are, but that's modern times. <laughs> so, um, I think a lot of it is it was very much the the sci-fi of the time was much more explorational, aspirational. Like there was a lot of times you just have an adventure where a guy is out on this weird, wacky alien world. And there wasn't this foundation of existing sci-fi uh, to, to build on. So people were like starting from scratch and saying, what are some weird alien planets we can think of? What are some weird ideas and environments? Like science is uh, more about what is randomly possible, not really necessarily as founded in like, quantum mechanics or the realities of our universe. It's like, okay, we're going to send a rocket and launch it into space. And of course it can travel to another planet. It goes really fast. Why not? Like without like, the ideas of like, relativity and the actual vast distances between them. So some of that concrete detail that I, I think is in a lot of modern sci-fi didn't really exist back then. It was more just about the, the fantastical story that they were trying to tell and the, the environment they were using to try and like, wrestle with modern events and try and come up with some way to rationalize those and show the main the, the main character as the hero who finds a way to, to solve problems in any environment they see themselves in like there's a very simplistic view of morality in the world there that i think is can be like very appealing especially given how complicated times are right now yeah exactly um, so I think like there's there's a certain amount like romanticism to that that the outer worlds tried to like tap into as far as like our our sci-fi is pulp sci-fi like we have things like the shrink ray or the the gloop gun that causes people to float like it's more focused like what is the like the wacky science of the idea as opposed to like how would this really work given quantum mechanics and reality of physics and things like that that that's not so much the focus of the game it's definitely using sci-fi as a setting to allow us to inject humor and some lightheartedness into the into the world while also like wrestling with like something that I think a lot of modern people can really get behind and understand is like the the struggle of dealing with like massive corporate entities and how their influence on our day-to-day -day lives affects our ability to to thrive and be successful and be happy or breathe <laughs> so <laughs> I remember talking to Tim. Oh man, that must have been—I forget how many years ago. Probably best not to think about it. Uh, but you know, I remember he was talking about the Fallout, original Fallouts, and how he said he wanted to uh, uh, how to word this, uh, make it clear that our government was lying to us. I think this <laughs> the way he put that. And you know, do you, do you have a similar sort of message, or maybe a different message for the outer worlds? Is there some kind of deeper meaning underneath the? You know, the satire and the fun? Well, I think I mean, a lot of it is, like, the, the the corporations that were, like, lampooning, like, obviously these aren't real corporations. They, they don't exist in, in in modern times. But we're, like, kind of making fun of some of the the idea of the the, the corporate oligarchy, that the idea that the, the rich and wealthy are the best people to make decisions for everybody because, like, it's the, the trickle-down Reaganomics and everything that we have dealt with over the past several decades as a society the idea that unbridled capitalism capitalism is the solution to every problem that's kind of that concept taken to an extreme in in halcyon which is the the, the colony that this uh, the outer world is set in where corporations run everything everything is done for the the, the profit line the the Ultimately, the what's best for the corporation is whatever makes money, and anything that doesn't make money for the corporation is not necessary. And people have to kind of survive in the gaps in between as best they can. So, I think that was one of the things we were really trying to focus on is like taking like something that we're all we all experience every day in, in modern life, and just taking it to like an absurd extreme and injecting that, having the humor there, and also 
just showing kind of like the some of the sadness that lies below all that as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was just thinking of you know while there's a you know with the Fallout series there's that concern about I guess the Cold War and we might get nuked. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I just wonder like what back in the twenties and thirties I wonder what was the big fear. Yeah, I mean definitely was a lot of the uh, like the Red Scare, the idea of. Uh, socialism and communism and threatening the the american way of life like that was very much like the central uh uh angst of society well, it doesn't seem all that strange as to what's going on i know nowadays. <laughs> well, one of the things that's gotten a lot of attention just in terms of the game play mechanics is the way the skills work uh, the experience system mm-hmm. uh, the companions in the game uh, I, I was watching a bunch of reviews uh, for it before this uh, yesterday and they, they were talking a lot about the flaw mechanic mm-hmm. yeah, that's very interesting uh so what i was what yeah what can you can you tell me a little bit about how this system got developed and sort of maybe anything that was tried and put aside and you know, just how did it end up the way it is and, and what do you think about it um so the uh like the, like the the, the flaw system specifically it's or nice, the, the the skill system and basically the, all the differences that uh, you introduced yeah. into <laughs> what makes it different yeah. than just the normal what we've seen a, a hundred times because I think it's quite different. It definitely so one of the things that um, we did we did differently for the Outer Worlds is we have um, individual skills obviously that people can put points into when they level up so you can increase your your heavy weapon skill your your rifle skill that sort of thing. Um, one of the things that came up during development is there was a concern that. By we ju- at that sorry at that point we just had the individual skills we didn't have the skill categories and there was a concern that by just having the individual skills it would make it very hard for people to play more of a generalist character everyone was kind of driven towards specializing from the very beginning of the game so Tim decided to add like the the, the skill categories and actually change it so that you put points into those categories first before you could specialize in individual skills that way early on. If you like, it was trying to address the problem that they uh, like he always brings up one of the early Fallout games. Like, you put all your weapons into energy pistols, and then you don't find an energy weapon until halfway through the game. Yeah. So, you basically <laughs> wasted a lot of those points early on. Like, so by having the, the investing in the categories, while well, you first start playing the game, you're kind of exploring. You're not really sure exactly what weapons are going to be good, which ones are going to be bad, what will even be available early on. So, by just generally putting points into broad categories like ranged weapons or melee weapons it makes it easier for you as a player to pick up whatever you find and have it be useful to you rather than saying oh my very first weapon in the game is an assault rifle i should have put points into that i should go reroll my character and start over like um so we're trying to address uh, that as a problem and also wanted to make sure that for the different play styles whether it's combat stealth dialogue leadership there were broad categories that supported those and also specific skills that players could really dive into and get more specific and more benefits if they really wanted to be the persuasive pistol wielding rogue if that was like their their goal for their their character they could make that uh that gameplay fantasy with the skill system that was interesting like with the persuasion system how how it also affects the combat yes i don't know if i've seen that in other games is that seemed like a pretty big innovation and it was definitely something that um, that Tim and Leonard really wanted is, is that the even though you're playing a, a focusing maybe on a dialogue character or a stealth character, you're still going to be engaging in combat. Like there's, it's very hard and kind of an edge case to have a game experience that is all one thing. Mm-hmm. Like it, it's probably pretty easy to be an all combat character if you want because you can just shoot anybody at any time that you want to. But trying to only be a stealth character, or only be a dialogue character, requires a lot more work so they wanted to make sure that even for players who had put points into those skills they would still gain some benefits during combat as well so that was kind of the impetus behind that that change and then uh you brought the the flaw system oh yeah um tim has talked about this like he he wanted a system where the game was reacting to the player uh, because typically the player like when they level up they put points into the game and then that's like them making a choice of how to uh how they want to to engage with the game the flaw system was okay the game's looking at what the player's actually doing what's actually happening to them and reacting to 
decisions and choices and mistakes that the player maybe isn't even necessarily aware of. So as you, things are happening, like you're, you know, you keep jumping off of high places. What if we give you a fear of heights? How is that going to change your gameplay? Is that going to, uh, is that going to be worth it to you to take that flaw in order to get an additional perk and specialize your character in a different way? So that was definitely something that I think has gone been received very well by a lot of reviewers. Yeah, that's really clever. Kind of reminds me of a really sneaky dungeon master, you know, would try something like yes. that. Yes. <laughs> bring it back some I think the tabletop he, yeah. experience. Definitely. I think that the biggest the biggest thing with the flaw system is that towards the end of the game, like when we had no more programming time, when we kept coming with ideas for for newer and different flaws that we really wanted to add to the game, but we just didn't have the time to do it. Like, uh, there was one that one of our uh, our animators suggested was uh, if you reject three flaws in a row without ever taking a flaw, you get the narcissism flaw. Like you think you have no flaws, <laughs> don't you? <laughs> That's good. Like we want to do things like that, we just like, kind of ran out of time. So hopefully, in in few further iterations of the of the game world, we can like add more of of that type of reactivity and humor to the system as well. Do you have a favorite flaw? Uh, I think honestly the 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 fear of heights because just like it uh, it's one of those things that in a lot of games like having enemies attack you and having reactions to that or weaknesses to that is like kind of fairly standard like mm -hmm. the fact that we're like tracking how often are you jumping off of high places how often are you taking damage when you fall and then detecting like okay you're getting close to an edge this is where that flash should start kicking in and applying a a uh, penalty to your character at that point. I just enjoy the fact that the system is flexible enough to allow that sort of flaw to exist alongside flaws where you are more weak against certain types of enemies. Yeah, it's really fascinating to me. Just the more I think about it, the sort of learning from the player and making special opportunities mm -hmm. for really unique experience. It's, that's really cool. Uh, Brian, one thing I was kind of picking up on, maybe we can get into this later with the tyranny, uh, discussion mm -hmm. as well but i take it you're not a big fan of the traditional class system of a lot of role play well probably 99 percent of role playing games right you... <laughs> yeah i guess i always find that i want to make the character that falls between the classes or that's a combination of three or four different classes that i i think it's very it's very good at helping people understand a clear role for things like MMOs or multiplayer games that are very much focused around your role in a group, I think the class system is fantastic. It really helps people clearly identify what they're going to be doing and how they fit into the uh, like the needs of a team and a group of people. I think when you're looking at more of like a single player experience, I definitely gravitate more towards skill based games that allow you to define your character based on the the skills you want to use or the attributes or traits that you pick for your character that kind of gets you those hybrid characters that you may not be able to make with a purely class-based system or that you may have to wait until a higher level to specialize into a prestige class or some other variant or multi-class in order to be able to achieve that. That's a big consideration. Now, I think a lot of people would agree with you, though. They don't like those having to pick from a narrow list of, of mm -hmm. classes. Well, one of the things I had seen uh, you talk about in some of the other interviews was the the fact that you can kill anybody <laughs> in the game, even like the, who, if it's a quest giver, who cares? Kill them, you know, yeah. and still be mm -hmm. able to get through the game. And so, no, this is a problem that's probably come up. They'll tell them how many times in other role playing game developments, right? Yes. Uh, so, what do you think? Looking back on it, was it? Uh, well, maybe you could talk a little bit about what made it challenging to implement it that way. But uh, do you think it was worth it? I think it is. I think it's it's definitely like a, it's a lot of work. Like essentially, like if you have an NPC who is related to a quest, who's supposed to give you some information via dialogue, if the player can kill that NPC at any time, you have to track. Okay, well, what happens to that quest now? Does it just mm -hmm. fail, or is there another way for the player to get that information? Is it through a terminal nearby? Is there a loot item on the body of the NPC? Is there something else, some other backup way for the player to get the information they need or the, the, the key for the lock or the password or whatever it is they need to advance the quest. How do they move forward from that point if the NPC is dead? And all of those different options start having knock-on effects for things like, 
okay, giving the right feedback in the quest journal for the player, making sure that the, the like, quest beacons for guiding the player in the world now point to the correct location for where the alternate backup information is. Like All of like the, the miscellaneous feedback elements in the game for the player who shoots the NPC, saves the game, logs out and comes back a week later, now has to figure out, what the hell do I do to advance this quest? Like, all those things to help For them For me, that's like that an hour up. later I'm asking that kind of thing. <laughs> exactly. Like, all of that, that this stuff is all work that has to be done. And then, of course, beyond that one moment, there's now how do the other NPCs in the world around them and on that quest chain react to this NPC being dead? Is that going to cause problems? Is it going to make the quest giver, should they now be mad at you for killing this person? Do they not care about the means as long as the end goal is reached, that sort of thing. So it's it's a lot of different complications to think through when you're designing the quest, but it's also a lot of opportunities for players to have the game react to their choices and see that reactivity matter in the world around them. So it's a lot of work, but I think when you're trying to make a game that's all about choice and consequence, yeah. that is one that is worth spending the time to do. Because a lot of times we talk about like, well, maybe not every NPC should be killable. Maybe there's some that we don't allow you to. And like in Outer Worlds, you you can't kill Phineas until the very end. It was just would have been much too much work to allow you to kill him early on. So we have him behind bulletproof glass. You can't kill him until the very end of the game. There's another NPC that you're not able to kill until partway through the quest line in case because it would just cause too many problems otherwise. So. We do, do like use that trick occasionally, but we try hard to avoid it whenever we can, just because ultimately, if the player wants to be the person who just like goes around and kills every NPC who pisses them off, well, that's the game experience they want to have. And if we can support it, and it's not going to create a thousand bugs or make the game unplayable or make the game experience worse for other players, why not support it? You know, there's got to be somebody out there that's going to figure out a way. <laughs> yeah, well, I like that approach to to game narratives. You know, I I, I talk to a lot of people; they're very rightfully pr- proud of their stories they come up with for a game. But you kind of wonder sometimes, yeah, but that's sort of your story. It's not the yep. what you want to do is like let let the player make the story. As much as you can, you, you basically want to try and create hooks for the player to make choices, and then like generally for a game, you're going to have some high level through line or narrative that you want to guide the player along just because we don't have the budget or time to create an actual living world with any possible story the player may not may want to uh, to engage in so there is there is some boundaries that we funnel the player down just honestly for limits of scope and time but within that we try to give as much room for the player choice to be meaningful as possible um and definitely to like the, the Phineas thing along during development the number of bugs we found with ways people could kill our QA testers were able to kill him <laughs> even behind one yeah, they were it. Wow. Well, I mean, they had, they had to test it. And oh, sure. Usually whenever a new weapon would come online, there'd be a bug. Like when we first got grenades, um, like the AOE damage from a grenade wasn't checking line of sight, so it would kill Phineas behind the glass. Or we got flamethrowers. <laughs> no, not Phineas. Flamethrowers were testing line of sight, so they would kill Phineas through the glass. It was... Like just constantly, these like bugs would creep up where different systems would change, and now you could kill Phineas. And it's like, oh come on! <laughs> the excellent extent on that. Yes. Yes. The, the time. I mean, that's one thing I was really. I think we could agree on it. I've talked to a lot of people. Most of us play in these. You know, we grew up with these games. We're older now. We have families, mm-hmm. jobs. You know, we don't have the wood that we had. You know. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of hours to, uh, to pour into these things. But, you know, it makes it really tough. You know, we don't mm-hmm. have to try as many games, if you know, if we don't have that kind of time, much less review them. You know, I really appreciate these sort of shorter, or however you want to say it, you know. Yeah. The smaller scope just makes it easier to complete. And plus, even better, you actually get to replay it now. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's yeah. some of those other paths. It's more focused rather than shorter. <laughs> I mean, is this is this for you more like just a virtu- making a virtue of necessity, I guess, or is it something that you think is, uh, you know, that you would choose to do even if you had unlimited money and time? And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. 
I hope to be back soon with the uh, second installment of this interview with Brian. A lot of great stuff coming up. We just kind of scratched the surface here, really. Uh, so stay tuned. The best is yet to come. Uh, as always, I want to thank you. Uh, thank you very, very, very much for your support of the show, for keeping these episodes in production. You know, I know a lot of folks are, are still hurting uh, financially, so that really means a lot to me uh, that you're still uh, willing to support the show. You know, and of course, if you're having financial difficulty, but you still want to support the show, don't forget uh, just tweeting about it, Facebooking about it, Instagramming, I don't know, TikTok about it, whatever you do. <laughs> you know, it's all about the word of mouth. Uh, it's really a powerful uh, force. So, you know, you might uh, think, well, who cares? You know, I'm just re retreat <laughs> retweeting it. Who cares? But uh, I really care and I really appreciate it. And I love to see that. So uh, thank you for all your support for the show. And uh, while I'm thinking about it, got a couple new rats in the pack. Three new ones, actually. That's exciting. Uh, Vi, or Vey, Graham. I think I know who Graham is. He probably did, too. Uh, he will be the uh, the seventh guest here in our uh, Matt Chat <laughs> Discord channel, hopefully. And uh, Ken. Uh, so welcome to the uh, pack, guys. Uh, really cool stuff. Uh, we're getting really close to that three episodes a month. I mean, it's within spitting distance at this point. Uh, so, you know, if you are back to work and everything is uh, hunky-dory for you, please go, you know, set it and forget it. Uh, see what you can do about that Matt Chat uh, Patreon setting uh, so we can get back to uh, normal here as soon as possible. Uh, but anyway, uh, once again, really appreciate all your help, guys, and uh, welcome Vi, Graham, and Ken. All right, what about that news from the Matt Cave? A couple of quick items here. We've got a new, a uh, couple new trailers that I want to mention. Uh, first is uh, for Wasteland 3. It's the Factions of Colorado trailer. I think it's about a minute and a half long, something like that. But it gives you a pretty good uh, glimpse, I think, into the uh, the vibe of that game, the aesthetic, the aesthetic and the tone of it. Uh, they got a faction in there I thought was kind of fun called the Gippers. Uh, Ronald Reagan inspired. Uh, cult, heavily armed cult devoted to the God President <laughs> Ronald Reagan. Uh, so they're having some fun with that. Uh, go check it out. Uh, let me know what you think about these new factions for Wasteland 3. Uh, the second one, uh, second item, is a new gameplay trailer, they're calling it, for the Baldur's Gate 3 game that we've been talking about off and on here. I know a lot of uh, folks are excited about it, including uh, yours truly. Uh, they are, you know, like everybody else, they've been affected by all this, uh, you know, all the COVID-related stuff. It's kind of probably going to lead to a delay uh, in the uh, release date of this game. But they were able to put this uh, early access, or what do they call this, an early alpha trailer, whatever, uh, for the game. And I, you know, I think you can tell by looking at this, it has come a long way. Uh, I was uh, hoping for a little bit more gameplay in something they're billing as a gameplay trailer, but, you know, okay. <laughs> Uh, anyway, it looks like they're still shooting for this August date, but, but you know, again, they probably will. Uh, they pretty much said that's uh, wishful thinking at this point, so we'll see what uh, what, what happens there. Uh, and then uh, the third item here, I got four items today. So the third item, uh, Pierre, good friend Pierre, hoping to have him on this show very soon. Uh, anyway, he's Knights of the Chalice 2, still in Kickstarter. He's got uh, 17 days left. He's got 625 backers on that so far. He's raised uh, $36,000 with some change. And then uh, if you uh, haven't jumped on this already, it's $26 to get the digital copy tier. Uh, so the tier where you get the game, <laughs> $26. You know, that's a, that's a really good deal. I'm sure it'll be at least that when it comes out. So uh, I I'm absolutely confident Pierre will deliver on this. So you're basically getting a pretty cool game uh, for 26 bucks, and a really cool game if you like classic uh, style and aesthetics. So definitely go check it out if you haven't seen the old uh, uh, Match Chat video I did on the first one. You know, you can go check that out. Uh, but definitely at least take a look at this. I think it'll be really interesting uh, for you. And then finally, uh, Neil Halford, good old Neil uh, Halford, maybe get him on the show again pretty soon. Uh, or it might be that I'm on his show. Uh, we'll see how that goes. But he's doing something he's calling the Lock Down Con. Uh, so this is on from June 26th 
to uh, through June 28th, so a couple days there. It's all online. It's all free. It's basically this big online uh, convention. A bunch of uh, comic book folks. He's got uh, fantasy authors, science fiction authors, uh, TV personalities, actors. But uh, for our purposes, what's probably most interesting are the uh, game devs that he's got on there. He's got Chris Avalon, John Cutter, who I've had on this show. Both, I've actually had both of those guys on the show before. Uh, but I haven't, uh, one that I haven't had on the show is Trip Hawkins. So you probably heard that name before. Uh, Neil is, uh, what we're trying to do is set it up so that uh, we can sort of do a panel with Trip. You know, Alex will be part of the panel. Uh, so that'd be exciting. I haven't ever gotten to uh, talk to, uh, talk to Trip before. Uh, so that'd be fun. Uh, but anyway, we're still working out the details on that. So I don't want to make any promises. Uh, but definitely uh, stay tuned. I will uh, fill you in as we know more about the details. But just for now, I think it's safe to say you want to book or clear some uh, space in your calendar from June 26th through the 28th. So basically the uh, towards the end of this month. And so hopefully see you there. So let's wrap this up with a quote. And I was looking up for quotes from the golden age of the sci-fi pulps. And uh, one of the names, of course, that comes up when you do a search for that is John W. Campbell Jr., really famous uh, editor as well as an author, where he basically got a lot of uh, folks' careers off the ground. He's an interesting guy. You should look him up. Uh, but anyway, uh, I found a great quote for him I thought would be good for this week. Uh, it goes something like this. History does not always repeat itself. Sometimes it just yells, Can't you remember anything I told you? And let's fly with a club. <laughs> yeah, I think that, that quote kind of gives you some good insight into what uh, John W. Campbell Jr. must have been like in real life. It's a lot of fun. Uh, anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed that and see you next time. of a four-year-old and the sexual sophistication of a donkey. <laughs>